All right, hey guys, so I'm Rich Lucetti, I'm a solutions architect at Red Hat, and like Tony said, you know, we work together and we've been looking at the edge capabilities. So this was something we started really diving into with, you know, the two of us and our broader team earlier this year. So I'll talk about sort of the recognized use cases, why we want to pursue this, why my particular interest is in this, this specific area, and then we'll um, go through a short set of slides, so it's not going to be too long. I borrowed this content heavily from Tony. And then I have a demo to show you. There's a lot of content in the demo. I would say it 90% works. You know, I had some issues last night, so we'll explain what's working, what's not working, and, and sort of go over what the intent is. So let's begin by just talking about edge in general. So my experience in this space goes back many, many years. So like some of the folks on here, I haven't, I haven't worked as long in the field as some, and I've worked longer than others, but um, back in the early 2000s, I was at a small company in Maryland where we were supplying SATCOM equipment to the U.S. military. So when they were in Iraq and Afghanistan, this was the principal communications method that they had. And it was very short text messages. So it was 100 characters or less, as well as uh, you know their situational awareness, like where they're at or what, what's, what's going on around them. So they would have maps in their vehicles and the way to send very short messages back and forth. On the forward link, or what would be from the ground station to these tactical vehicles, it was the equivalent of a 2600 baud motor. So we were going over geosynchronous satellite on L-band. It's very expensive when you reuse commercial satellites and they charge you by the power consumed. So there was a, a really small pipe to communicate to these guys, and it was a serialized channel. So every packet had to follow after every other packet. On the return signal, you could overlap, so you could do up to four or five overlapping packets. So you got a little more bandwidth going back. But my experience with the Army was supporting these folks who were using this system along with small applications inside their vehicles. One of the challenges they encountered was how to update and maintain software. So as these vehicles were fielded in, in these remote areas, they were very infrequently able to get to a depot or somewhere where there could be maintenance done. When they did get there, the way they updated software was to open up these hermetically sealed cases and swap hard drives. So they had a very large hard drive duplication capability. So they were copying hard drives and then trying to swap hard drives in and out of these um, computers when they came into service. There was no way to do over-the-air updates. There was no way to, to keep things up to date. And then the images they were given, it wasn't always clear what the content was. So the Army liked to do these gold masters where they would carefully, you know, construct or try to document what's on there, but there's always the chance that, you know, you get changes that are smaller and inadvertent that somehow, you know, get into a subset of the of the population of vehicles that are being maintained. So so these were real headaches for them. We recently had a conversation where for the folks that are maintaining the legacy systems, this activity still goes on. So my particular interest here is to help them do this better, help how can we take this technology that I'm going to talk about today and apply it to that problem space where it's much easier to maintain software going forward? And it gives them a way to be more reactive. One of the things we see within the DOD particularly is this desire to be able to react faster to changing conditions and situations. How can they roll out software? How can they change the applications they have to make them uh, maintain dominance in the battlefield? How can they not be overwhelmed by, you know, these emerging powers that are almost reaching peer level capability with us? So so there's this real need for battlefield dominance, there's this real need to um, be competitive, and that's principally tied to your ability to change and adapt to what's being used in the battlefield. So I'm going to, you know, sort of preface what I'm going to talk about today with just that background to help you guys, you know, understand my interest. Um, Tony comes to this space. He, he was with the DOD working with some of the ground combat system teams. He's now going back to working with NASA. He's still staying with Red Hat, but NASA will be his principal partner. But this idea of you know easily maintainable uh, OS images, easily maintainable applications is something that you know NASA would like in, in their environment as well. You know, we talked to a lot of folks in these spaces. So let's go ahead and take a look at these slides. I'm going to share my screen. And while I'm talking, I can't see the chat or anything, so please, um, you know, if you have questions, just unmute and, and call them out. And I, I, there's, there's plenty of time based on the content I have, so we shouldn't have any issue with that. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen today. All right, 
All right. Do you guys see the slots? Yep, we see them. Yes. All right. So I'm going to give you like an overview, not so much a roadmap, more of an overview of uh, the RHEL Image Builder. So this was a capability that was released with RHEL 8.3. That was early November, I think it was like right before election day, or on election day. And then uh, this image builder was was completely announced in, with a marketing blitz on November 17th. So it delayed a little bit from the GA, although all the bits were there initially. So it fits into Red Hat's vision of open hybrid cloud, where we want to provide tools that allow developers to deploy applications anywhere, whether that's on small bare metal servers, you know, in a data center or at the edge, virtual machines, a private cloud based on OpenStack or related technology, some one of many public clouds, or you know, all of these areas when you want to run software, we want to be able to support you and have it be very easy to move workloads across these environments. And it's also got comprehensive management and automation. So we want to make sure that once you deploy solutions, it's easy to maintain them <coughs> and keep them running going forward. So if you look at the main areas of focus when you're deploying applications, we tend to do really well in the deploy or instantiate an instance, maintain and manage it, upgrade or retire it across all of those environments. But the one piece that's always been a little bit of a miss is the OS assembly piece. If I'm going to deploy an application, how do I control or best manage the system that I'm creating in order to deploy my, my set of applications or workloads? And there's been different tools and, and ways to approach this. So RPMs, a Red Hat package management system, is one way to do this, where you can create packages and then you install the packages you need into a base image. Um, containers are another way to deploy applications. You can use technology like Podman if you don't want to run Kubernetes or other related container um, engines. Um, you can uh, point to third-party uh, repositories and grab packages from there, or you can just natively deploy content. But it was always sort of a mixed match of how do you create these things and how do you maintain these and how do you know really well what's running on any given system. So RHEL Image Builder was created to sort of address that gap. It was a way to help you create and assemble and customize these OS images where they're atomically updated. So each image is seen as an atomic unit. So instead of making a point change to an image, you just roll forward a new image. But you want to make sure you do that efficiently. So if you look at some of the tooling that's out there, we have things like Red Hat Satellite can help with the provisioning. You, know, you can pixie boot things and pull subscriptions and content and get that all automated. Um, you have Ansible Automation Platform, but once you're into the deploy instantiation phase, you can have playbooks that call other playbooks and, and do a, a comprehensive view of, of what's running in that environment. There's a bunch of tools on cloud.redhat.com where we have labs and, and other capabilities to help you create things. Insights is not something I've seen adopted greatly by the government, more in the commercial space, but it's a AI ML capability hosted at Red Hat where if you register your systems through Insights, we'll do intelligent analysis of what's going on in your system and make recommendations, what patches you need, what optimizations could be enabled. Um, there, it's, 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 it's quite a capable tool. The challenge we have with the federal space is getting people to agree to share the information. And you can scrub it, you can remove information that's sensitive, but there's still just a reticence to, to share information like that. And then we have Image Builder. Image Builder is really focused on this OS assembly piece, making that work easier and, and better for the, the customers that need that. So our targeted use cases for this are the open hybrid cloud, so wherever you want to run your systems, whether it's in a classic data center, privately behind your, your firewall, it's a public cloud, or you know, one of many public clouds, or even a private cloud, we want to support you. But we also want to support that embedded and edge use case. Um, so Image Builder is the capability that you run on premise. You can run a set of these things. You can create a build farm. And it takes as input the various sources of packages that are out there and runs the composer to create the images that are going to be used to deploy to your target systems. Um, there's no, so today with, with the 8.3 release, we support x86 64. 
Um, there's plans to support other alternatives that are uh, architectures that are still in the in working uh, uh, work in progress. There's no cross version support. You can't cross compile things. You can't um, you know use a x86 to build an ARM image or something like that yet. Um, eventually, that's going to uh, uh, be something that we, we we provide. But that would be packages used to assemble images, not necessarily cross compile. And when you think of the workflow here, so um, the builder capability can reach out to satellite and Ansible that can help pool content or populate content that then feeds back into builder and eventually you're going to get an image that can run on any one of these targeted um, environments. So that could be bare metal, virtual, private cloud, public cloud, or, or the edge. So this is the interface. So what you're looking at here is the web console for Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And in the web console, added to the left-hand side, there's an image builder. So the image builder has a couple of concepts you need to understand. One is blueprints. So a blueprint is the template of the thing you want to create. So it could be, it includes the packages that you want to install into your image. It includes um, other customizations. Now the UI is not as rich as the command line tool at the current moment. So there's more customizations than what's shown here, but through the UI, you can add users to your image. You can customize the host name if you want. I don't know why you would put a host name in a template file, but you can do that. Um, and then you can customize the packages. With the, the command line tool, there's a greater set of things you can do. And that's under the welder.io project. So W-E-L-D-R.io contains a lot of the uh, information on what can go into a blueprint file. Once you make a change to a blueprint file or you create things, you're going to commit it. So here we're, we're showing packages being added. So up to the right here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but at the very right there's sort of three dots that are vertical. So clicking on that allows you to do things like manage the sources of where the packages are coming from. By default, you're going to pull from the uh, Well 8 repository. So this is going to be base OS and app stream. Um, you can add additional sources. One other thing to keep in mind is when you build your image, there's a base set of packages you can't go below. So the core set of packages has to be in your image. And those are those are there by default. That's sort of a minimal set of packages necessary to run the operating system. It's about 600 to 700 megabytes of, 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 of completed image just with the base stuff. And then anything you add on top of that increases the size. So you can add packages to a blueprint where you can remove the packages you added, but you can't remove the, any of the base set of packages. So Blueprint, the um, Composer CLI, or the command line interface for the Composer, has a bunch of commands that you can use from the command line. So you can say Blueprints help and find out information about um, how to interact with Blueprints. There's command line completion, so hitting tab usually gives you like the, the next thing you can type. Um, you can do Blueprints list and see a list of all the Blueprints you've created. You can do a blueprint save. So here I'm saying save this blueprint with this name. That actually does an interesting thing. It actually pulls the blueprint off of the server and saves it locally to my environment. So I can get my blueprint. Now the blueprint is in a TOML format. Does anyone know what TOML stands for? It's good trivia. It's Tom's markup language, isn't it? It's Tom's obvious markup language. Obvious. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're familiar with INI files, it looks just like that. But they, they formalized the spec, and, and this guy, Tom, came up with it, so he got the name of, of the markup line. Hey, Rich, may I ask you a question? Sure. So uh, I'm confused about this composer tool, like, or as an OS builder. Like, I thought that, and maybe, maybe it uses it under the covers, so, um, but I, was, I always thought that RHEL kind of used uh, kickstart files and cobbler to do like question. package building or image building and, and configuration um, if you wanted to start from uh, so those scratch. it's actually both so what this is going to do what the composer tool does and if this wasn't clear you know I'm happy to, to to talk about this further but we'll also see this in action what this does is it creates a RPM OS tree image so it's an atomic image of an operating system so all of the packages, everything is in a signed hash. So when you install your operating system, you install version one of the operating system as an example. If you want to change anything, 
you would create an entire new image of the operating system, and then you would install that new image. And you could say its parent is the prior image. So when I do that, when I go through the mechanics of actually doing that, it only downloads the deltas. It actually doesn't pull the entire image. But it, at boot time, it's going to do a roll forward to that new image. If that should fail for whatever reason, and I'll show you how to check that, you just atomically roll back to the operating system you had before. So the nice thing about this is if you think about a traditional way of maintaining a system, yeah, you can use kickstart files, and, and we can still do kickstart files through this. But applying packages and then undoing packages, if I install a package and it fails for some reason, you know, I got to install that package, and should I also install, uninstall its dependencies? And it gets to be a little messy with, you know, who made what change. Or if I go in there and touch configuration files, now I got to deal with what the impacts of that, how I roll back that. So, so this is really meant to be, you know, an atomic way of deploying and updating your operating system. And we'll we'll show you how that works. So, so that so is it kind of like uh, Canonical's Snap system? I'm not I'm not familiar with Snap, but okay. um, so so this is this is basically about creating an atomic operating system. So there's a project Atomic uh, out in the community, and that's that's what this is based on. So it creates an OS tree or an RPM OS tree image. So you can't, you can look at the packages using tools, but you can't really modify an image once it's created. You just create another image. And then the compose command for the composer CLI is how you would build these things. So you can see what types or what targets you can build. And the targets that are supported are like AMIs or for Azure, their, their system images, or a, a tar file, which we're going to work with today. That's sort of your rel for edge OS tree. So there's many targets you can create. So this command right here where it says composer CLI, compose start, you're giving it the name of a blueprint, in this case, raw minimal, and then you're telling it I want to keep Cal 2 image to come out. Hey, Rich, it's Tony. Mind if I uh, add something real quick? Sure. Yeah, so regarding the question about uh, Snap, um, that's more for distributing individual applications, right? Bundling up uh, an application's dependencies and making sure it can run on pretty much any Linux distribution where Snap uh, is available. So I would say Snap is more similar to Flatpak, right? Um, with the caveat that Snap doesn't solely focus on desktop applications. Uh, Canonical has extended it to support things like Kubernetes and all that kind of stuff. So with Composer, uh, aka Image Builder, it's really designed to output different flavors of a RHEL image that can be deployed pretty much anywhere, right? So. Rich is focusing mostly on the Edge use case, which uses this Atomic OS, which he'll get into a little bit more. But it can also spit out things like, you know, QCOW images, Amazon uh, AMI images, Azure images. Uh, the idea being that you build your gold image and you deploy it in the cloud rather than using one uh, that's already, you know, kind of generalized and built by the provider for you. Um, so it could be, you know, uh, could have like a security baseline already applied to it, things like that that might be important. So. so I, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, I keep asking this question. I'm just trying to poke at this, like, see if I can match it up to the technologies that I'm aware of. Is it is it similar in some sense to HashiCorp's Terraform? Yes. Yeah. A closer analogy? I, yeah. You, HashiCorp, what I think of more is Packer. Is that maybe what you're referring uh, to? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, Packer. In fact, yeah. we, we mentioned those at the end. So, yes, I would say it's close, more closely aligned to that technology. Um, I would agree. Cool. Thank you. Good question. So when you have a job running, when you use Compose to start a job, you can check its status using status, or you can check info about that job. So every image is going to have a UUID associated with it, and you can download those images using those UUIDs. So let's dig into the blueprint a little bit. So like I said, in the UI, the web console UI, there's a limit to what's customizable, but there's a greater uh, amount of stuff you can do through the, the blueprint file itself. And there's some examples of technology or tags that aren't yet supported, so I'll show you those as well. They're, they're, they were in the upstream, but they're not uh, officially implemented yet. So so here you have the name of your blueprint, in this case, well minimal. And then you say, you know, a, des a description of what it is, assign a version number to it. Modules refer to the upstream modules, so you can install things that are going to get updated more often than RHEL typically does. So in the past, we had this thing called RHEL, uh, Red Hat Software Collections Library, where folks wanted to install Apache on their RHEL instance, but 
because Rel had such a long life cycle, Apache would kind of get long in the tooth over time, and they wanted to run something more current. Well, modules is the latest way with Rel 8 to deal with that issue, where you can update Apache beyond what the Apache was that was distributed with the operating system, but in a way that doesn't cause any issues or, 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 or problems. You can have many versions of Apache on your system and decide which ones are active. Um, then typically groups are another way to install packages where instead of installing packages individually, I could say give me all of the development tools. And there's a group called development tool. You can do a young group list and see what the groups are, but um, you can install that as well. Or you can name individual packages. Version asterisk means give me all versions of Ansible. You know, install that into my image. Give me all versions of Cockpit, install that into my image. Um, you can set the host name. You can create users. Uh, Let's see, you can uh, customize time zone, locale, set up firewall settings, as well as define um, system D services that you want to have up and running when the, when the system uh, is, is created. So this sort of repeats some of that stuff, but it just tells you where the, what are the defined customizations beyond just the package list that's in your environment. So Composer is what you use to create these things. I already, I already talked about this, where you can, uh, you know, given a blueprint file, you can build any number of targets or types that you want to create. The outputs today, um, with RHEL 7, we, in, we introduced uh, QCAL2, that's the QEMU copy on write um, second version. We also have uh, raw partition disk images, so these are just, um, you know, raw image files that can be created both in extended for as well as um, uh, the, the raw format, and then in RHEL 8, we added the ability to also do Azure disk images, Amazon disk images, VMware machine, and, and OpenStack images. So we increased the capability of what could be output from this tool. Um, OS Build is the backend engine for this. Uh, Tony, was Lorax the backend engine before? Was that what you replaced, or was Lorax more of a front-end interface? Yeah, Lorex was the backend uh, engine that was replaced, and uh, uh, one thing I'll say about it is I was a little disappointed to see it replaced because going back to the Kickstart discussion, the way Lorex created the images, it was all based on Kickstarts under the covers, so you could get really advanced in terms of the uh, the tweaks you could make to these images, whereas mm -hmm. OS Build seems to generate everything on the fly using a, a Python-based uh, set of tools and scripts. So you can, and you can still customize through the Kickstart when you do the install of the machine, but it's not as part of the image itself. It's, it's more like as you're creating your image, here's the other customizations to be applied. Um, this talks about the UI a little bit. So here, if you're creating an Amazon uh, AMI, you can specify an S3 bucket, you can import it, you can give it the, the authentication information needed in order to do that. So as part of your creating your image itself, you're able to, to automatically update it into an S3 bucket for consumption on Amazon. Similar story with uh, Azure disk images and blobs where you can um, upload them as well. Now this slide's interesting to me. It says fast image assembly and configuration. We'll see how fast that is when I show you guys this. But um, once you have a blueprint, you'll set a type. So here you're going to say, I want, a, I want an RPM OS tree. It's going to be output as a tar file. And then I can say a parent commit. So this is how you relate one OS build to another. So each OS tree build has a OS tree ID or OS tree commit ID that specifies you know, a unique identifier for that. So when I build a new image based on an older image, and I transmit that to the systems that are out there, so we'll show how that works with the, uh, the RPM OS tree automatic timers, it's only going to pull the deltas. So it knows what it has. It only pulls the deltas between this version and the prior version. So that can be very small. That can be an incredibly small amount of data passing over the wire to update atomically the system to the next version. And like I said, if that fails, you can go back to a prior version. Um, some of the capabilities that are in here are really cool. So. Like I said about transactional updates, when I go to update my system, it's only going to send me the blocks I need. It's not going to send the entire image. Um, so this is really optimized for low bandwidth environments. Um, it has intelligent OS rollbacks. So Greenboot was a project that was worked on through our Google Summer of Code participation. So we um, each year have college students apply 
to work with Red Hat engineers to create new capabilities or take on projects during a summer. So for this summer, it was Greenboot. They worked on Greenboot. Um, and that's a way to specify through either bash scripts or system D services whether the, 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 the OS boot is good. So you define the conditions on whether something is good or not, and then it's uh, that determines whether you accept the new atomic image or you roll back to the prior version. So the cool thing about this is when you pull that new version and go to start your system, it can do a health check on its own and then go back to a known good state if the, if the new version is good. And then you have the flexibility of the blueprint capability where you're able to specify all the content configuration and things you want within your system. Um, there's several ways to provision a system. So you can obviously use boot media. RHEL will start with, or uh, RHEL starts with the boot.iso image and then you add the the OS tree capabilities to that. Um, you can also do pixie booting with this. You can do satellite provisioning through templates. Um, in your kickstart, you can have a kickstart specified that does the normal kickstart things you're used to, but the key line here is at the bottom where it says OS tree setup. So it's going to point to some location where it's going to pull the image itself. So in this case, you know, there's a URL you provide where it's going to grab the content for the image, download that, install it as an atomic image. So it's not doing individual package installs. It's not doing anything like that. It's just running version X of your operating system. Um, there's a lot of resources here, and I'll, set, I'll share these links with you guys so you can uh, drill in here and uh, go look at these. But all these links are active. But there's a lot of information both on the upstream projects as well as the uh, Red Hat official documentation. And then, as mentioned earlier, you know, there are some alternatives in this space, so Terraform and Packer. I think Packer is just P-A-C-K-R. I don't think there's a B in there. Um, Azure and Amazon have tools as well, so since we have an Amazon guy on the line here, you might want to chime in and just mention a couple of things they have. And then there's tangential stuff. So Yocto is a is a open source project where you basically are compiling things from scratch. So it will run on any target hardware you know, ostensibly any, any target hardware or system, but you're doing a GCC compile of everything. So, so you're building purpose-built systems for the embedded solution you're going to run. So these tend to be really small form factor things, um, and it's, it, it takes a long time to, to generate your, your image. So the uh, the guy from uh, AWS, do you want to mention Outpost or any of these things that are listed here? Sure. So there obviously that I'm naturally biased because I work at Amazon, uh, but I'll just go over some of these items briefly. Um, Outpost is their essentially managed hardware solution to run AWS services inside of your own data center. So they send you a, a rack or a server depending on your configuration, and you basically just hook it in, and Amazon takes care of the rest. So you can manage your VMs from the AWS console, but they're running locally in your data center. And Amazon is responsible for doing uh, hard drive swaps and other types of maintenance wow. on um, on that hardware. Um, the EC2 image builder, similar <coughs> tool uh, along the lines of building images, though it is, uh, as, as far as I'm aware at least, it is specific to Amazon, so I believe you can only export Amazon images at, at least directly from the tools. You may be able to export them further from there, but it is designed for the, the AWS ecosystem. Uh, but similar tool along the lines of taking a, a base operating system and then uh, bootstrapping it or performing kernel updates, other types of software installations, and then packaging that as an image. Uh, Systems Manager is System Manager is really a suite of tools used to automate tasks on servers. Everything from um, collecting inventory of software patches to having uh, SSH sessions that can work through your browser through to automated patch management. So there's a lot within, within System Manager. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely some complementary tools in, in this space from the Amazon side, and I'm, I'm happy to also see that uh, 
that Red Hat has um, some integrations that you can export uh, to multiple types of formats depending on where you're ultimately hosting. Just a, a sidebar, I, I saw a recent announcement inside the last two weeks or so for a preview of a managed Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS that I'm, I'm interested to dig into. Awesome. So that is something that you know we're really working hard to get enabled within the public cloud providers, specifically in the government space. Um, you need clouds, so to make sure that it's available to our government customers, is turnkey OpenShift. So, so the announcement by Amazon recently is really good good news for us. Um, has anybody on the line worked with Yocto before we move on? I'm just curious if anyone has more experience. I haven't individually used it. I just you know read about it or, or talked to folks who you know have used it, but it's it's. It seems like it's a pretty low-level approach to doing similar things. I'm just curious if anyone on the line has any experience with the Octo. All right, I'll take that as a no. So now we can get into the demo and take really drill into this stuff. So um, let me go to the UI first. We'll just start. We'll just start here and look at some <coughs> capabilities. So I already have created a RHEL for Edge blueprint. If I click on this, so my RFE blueprint. Um, I can see that the customizations I've added is a username core, he has a password set, he's a server administrator. There's some additional actions, I can just delete the account basically. Um, or I can edit it, I can change the settings on that account. Up to the right, like I mentioned earlier, um, I can edit the description for this blueprint file. I can export it so I can get it as a file if I'm going to look at the raw file. Under packages, it's a it's an empty blueprint so the latest version I added a package in an early version then I removed it in the latest version so empty means there are no packages beyond the core base set of packages so if I click on edit packages I'll let this refresh you can see what I'm able to select from so there's quite a bit of stuff here that's included in, in the core distribution I can go I can add up to 5,000 different packages so I, I start with core these are the packages that can be added to this environment if I want to add capabilities. And it'll pull these plus all the, the appropriate um, dependencies. So as an example, to filter this down, if I wanted to add strace as a package, I could um, filter on that, and then I could just simply click a plus, and it would move. Whoops, that's interesting. Let's see if we refresh. There we go. So it'll move strace into a, a, a new selected component, and then all of its dependencies are also automatically included as well. Mm -hmm. So I can um, remove this if I don't want to do that. And then anytime I'm messing with my packages, there's a commit. So I have to commit these changes before I can build an image that includes them. Or I can just you know ignore these changes and not do a commit. So if we go back to here, the last thing is images. So here I've built two images. I've built a version 4 and a version 5. Um, one includes strace and one removes it. Um, and these inherit the 5 inherits from 4. So I did set the uh, parent correctly to do this. Let's go ahead and create a new blueprint. So we're going to go and create a, call this keylog. I know we're in FOSS now, FOSS RFP, for Rel for Edge, and this is uh, FOSS. We'll hit create. We'll let this run for a little bit. It'll populate the list of packages. So we'll go ahead and we'll add strace. Actually, we'll add git. Let's do something different. So it's going to start with a base set of packages and it's going to add the one that I asked. So I'm going to go ahead and say, let's add git to this. And I can look at some information about it. Um, I can uh, view more information about the package, where it's pulling the source, what versions I'm getting. I can select a specific version if I want. Star means all. And then I can look at its dependencies. What else is it pulling in? And understand that. So now that I'm happy that I want to do this, I'm going to go ahead and um, commit this change. So I'll just hit commit. It'll say you want to commit this, and I'll say yes. So it's, it's added that as an official package. So if I go back to my blueprint and look at it directly, you know, we can go ahead and create a user. So let's go ahead and create, you know, boss, Frederick, 
the source FLS the administrator and then give them a password of edge. And you can also put an SSH key in there too if you have a public SSH key file you want to enable for logging. So we'll go ahead and create that and it creates the hash password for me and sets that all correctly. Um, I can look at the packages. Again, it shows me what I added in the base image. And then under images, there's nothing there yet. So we can go ahead, since we committed these changes for the packages, I can go ahead and create an image. So I'm just going to click that. And it's going to say, what kind of image do you want to create? So I can select here, like we mentioned, a AMIs, an OpenStack, uh, QCal2. Uh, we'll do a rel for edge in this example, but I can also just create an archive. So this is the OS tree distribution. I can create a uh, Azure disk image, or I can create a VMware compatible file. So we'll select this. Now, when I select this, one thing I can paste in here is what the parent is. And I can also specify a reference. So this is similar to Git, where it's basically doing commits into a repository. You can have branches and things within your repository to, to enable that. So let's go ahead and just do a rel for edge commit. And it's going to say it's queued. And then in a second here, you'll see image build in progress. This takes between 15 and 30 minutes to run. So this does take a while to assemble the OS tree. So in the interest of time, I've already done that. So let's go ahead and open this up. Hey, hey Rich. Sure. Um, can you go back to uh, the image screen for your already staged blueprint? Sure. So this one? Yeah, and click on images and hit the logs for one of them, and then scroll all the way to the bottom. I don't know if you already kind of talked about this, or uh, you might just want to grab your scroll bar and bring it down. <laughs> so when you're creating those commits, you see that, that little hash right there? It says rel 8 x 64 edge and then the hash that starts with 4E9, that's the, uh, the, the commit ID or commit hash that you would use when you reference like a parent commit. Um, and then, does it have like who the parent is? Like, if I, I look at the, this one, I go to logs on this guy. That I don't know, but I would assume so. I've never, as you can see, it's a lot of information, so I've never really <laughs> yeah, read the whole thing. Let's see if we can pull this down. So it's an eight. So it has a different commit ID, and I'll show you that in the. Uh, well, there it is. There's the parent right there. So it tells you what the parent was and then it has its own hash. So like I said, it's only going to do the delta between the two when you do the update. So it's not going to pull the entire image again. So these are the, the examples. Let's quickly go back here. That's why they can build it. And look at the images. So we built two images. So let's go ahead and get into the, the um, command line, because you can see a lot of more interesting things there. I'm going to increase the size of this. Hopefully that's readable for everybody. So let's do it. What I have here is a 004 and a 005 directory. So that's where I pulled down the different um, tar files. So to do that, if I want to grab an image, okay. I can say composer, CLI, close image. And then if I hit tab, it gives me the IDs of the images that I want to download. So I can grab the 4C or the 047 and you know, just hit tab and it'll do it. What that allows me to do is see what's in these images. So if I go to version 4, which I just created a directory to do this one, I downloaded that tar image and I expanded it. So I did, I just untarred it. And it gave me this composed JSON file, which is some metadata about the image, and then the repo for all of the stuff in the image. So to look at that, do an RP, let's see, RP, and this. There's something else I need to set in here. Let's take it also. Revision. I'm not sure what I don't need to repo path, right? To get back in the end of the work, and this is in the history group. How many do you know? So anyway, you can list the packages through the command line using this DB list. I'm just not sure what it means by rev, whether it's the this ID or something else that you have to give it. 
but you can look at the, uh, the packages that are in here. Um, the Compose, if I want to take a look at that, let's clear this out and do a JQ. If you're not familiar, this is like a JSON query and it, it pre prints JSON files, otherwise, this is all in the pack. So you can see the OS tree commit. This is the identity of the image itself. And that's what would be used as a parent reference if I was going to build something from this. And then there's some other metadata here. Your ref is like we mentioned before, it's like a Git repository branch reference. And then you have the, the actual tag. Um, so the way you do this, the way you would instantiate a system based on this image is I can set up a um, web server that's going to provide this content and then have it pull the content. So let's take a look at this Edge KS file. This gets pretty deep in the weeds on the capability, what you're able to do here, especially for uh, an Edge type rollout. So I'm going to walk through these and explain some of this. Um, just to give you a flavor of what we're going after here. So in this first section, it's really your base stuff, right? You're going to use this kickstart file to boot a clean system, wipe out any master boot records, clear all the partitions, automatically repartition, you know, tell it to reboot after installation successful, run the installer in text mode, use DHCP to initialize networking. I'm going to create a user here. Um, it's kind of weird that the image creates the same user, but there is an error Tony discovered where if you don't have this line, it will actually fail to do the install. So, so it's, uh, it's something we got to trace back with engineering and find out why that is. And then this is a key line right here. So this OS tree setup is basically saying for the install, do an atomic install, full <laughs> content from this URL. So I'm going to run a simple Python web server in that directory. In this case, it will be the 004 directory that has this repo subdirectory. And that's where it's going to pull all the packages. And I'm going to say the root is rel, the specific branch or tag is edge, and then here's the pull reference right here. So it's going to go ahead and pull that content and do the install. So now what are some of the things we can do in post? Well, we can get very clever here with automatic updates and patching. So if we scroll down, we talk about post for a second. One of the things I want this system to do is continually look at that URL to see if there's new content. So that is a policy I can set for RPM OS tree daemon to say, I want you to use the stage policy. What that means, and it's this line right here, is that it's going to continually check that URL on a certain cadence and if it sees an update to the operating system or an update to the, the image, it's going to pull down the changes and stage them. They won't get applied until the next reboot, but they're ready to go. So I'll have the content on my system. Um, so the next time I reboot it, it's going to do the, it's going to attempt to do the new image. And if that should fail for any reason, it's going to roll back to the prior version. The next thing you're going to see here is a service. So we're calling an apply, we're creating what's called an apply update service with system D. So this is a one-shot, meaning that when this runs, it's going to run an exit. It's not going to stay up as a daemon. And you'll see in the command line here, which is a little bit complicated, it's basically asking a question, is there staged content? If there's staged content, then go ahead and reboot the system. Um, so that's that's basically what this service does. It simply checks if this other service was able to grab and cache content, and if it did, let's go ahead and do the update. We then uh, run this service on a timer. So this is right here. We create a timer in System D. So if you're not familiar, System D has many ways to activate services. You can use timers, you can use file paths, or you can use sockets. And it's, it's a really uh, clever way of handling this, handling dependencies. So let's say I have a bunch of web services and they're interdependent on each other. By using system D and the socket capability to activate those services, mm. you'll create a socket file and you'll create a service file with a matching name. Just like here, we have a timer file. And then up here, we have a service file with a matching name. When this timer goes off, it launches that service. For sockets with dependencies, when the socket gets a request to connect, it launches the matching service name and then passes a file description to that service. 
to handle that request. The service then binds to that socket and takes care of all future requests. So you can on-demand activate services, but that socket will hold the, the socket file descriptor until your service is ready to, to, to uh, respond to it. So for web, this works out great because you can have you know the 90 seconds of TCP doing these these connections uh, and, and waiting for the handshake to complete. So you can actually get an incredible amount of uh, um, parallelism when you're starting your system without having to worry about necessarily starting things in a specific order. But here we're going to use the timer to launch the service. The other way to do a, a service um, launch within System D is a file path. So that's where you would have like a print spool where you don't want to run the spool daemon in the background until there's actually something ready to print. Mm -hmm. So you can say that if a file shows up in bare spool, then launch these services to, to, to address that. And once there's no more work, they go away until a file shows up again. So it's a very clever way of uh, managing resources within your system. Here I'm going to have the supply update timer. So it's going to look every minute, 60 seconds after boot, and then 60 seconds every time afterwards and it's going to run on a one minute cadence however i could set this with a calendar i could say do this sunday at midnight every week or i could have other um ways of looking to see if i need to reboot because there's stage content so this timer just launches it, it'll go based on the, the um, criteria and then it'll run the, the appropriate matching service by name which does the work of rebooting the system so the other tool that's there is this RPM OS Tree B automatic timer. This is baked into the system already. I don't need to create this timer. I just need to enable it. So what this does is it checks the URL to see if there's updated content and it stages it. Currently, it runs once per day and it has sort of a splay. So it'll actually randomize some of the time where it's going to actually go and do this. So they're not all stomping on each other and handling their web server at the same time. Um, so I enable that timer, the RPM OS Tree B automatic, to check if there's content and pull it down. It'll run the service basically on a certain cadence. And then my apply update timer is checking every minute to see if there's stage content. So now we'll get a little more advanced. So I have the ability now with just those services, I have the ability to automatically update my atomic OS. So if you think of the edge case in a vehicle, you know, some tactical vehicle driving around, if it gets in range of a depot where it can pull OS content and, and it's you know within range at the appropriate time, based on how you configure this, it can pull this in stage updates for the next reboot. So you don't have to open up a hermetically sealed computer, you don't have to swap a hard drive, you don't have to do any of those things. The updates that are pulled are based on the prior image, so it's very efficient in its network bandwidth utilization. It's a very small amount of content, and we'll see that when we try this. So I'm able now to update my OS and automatically update my OS. We'll talk about green boot later and how you can determine if that's good or not, but you know, this those services alone give me that ability. So what about the workloads? What if we wanted to run containerized workloads with this in, within this environment? So I have an atomic OS with the tooling to support containers, and then I'm going to run a single containerized app in here. And I want to pull a new containerized app if it gets updated. So that's exactly what the next set of stuff does or, or enables within the Kickstart file. So here, we're going to create a auto update service for Podman. So again, it's a service, not a timer, but a service, and there's a timer we'll see in a second, that runs this Podman auto update command. So what that does is if I'm running a container application on my OS and it has a specific SHA-256 hash associated with the container, what the OCI spec says, Podman Auto Update will look at any running container within your system and check if the registry that that container came from has a newer image tag or a newer <laughs> um, hash. If it does, it'll update that, that container It'll pull that down basically and restart the container. So it'll automatically <coughs> um, re enable or refresh the application that you're running so you're not using an older version. And, and again, this is all touchless type operations. It's just going to check if you have a newer version, and if you do, it's going to pull it and execute it. So, what I've done in the examples that I'll show you is I created two versions of the same Apache app there's a V1 and a V2 and then there's a prod label that moves between the two. So I can change which one's active by moving prod, and that will trigger 
just so to do an update. Okay. That's the part of the demo that's not quite working. I was having some issues launching the, the service and I, I need to troubleshoot why. But if we scroll down here, the next thing you see we'll do is create the timer that triggers that auto update to occur. And in this case, you know, I could by default I could run this daily. I could say remember the last time you were run, so if anything interrupts, you know, when this is run, it remembers when last time it ran. And then I'm doing a randomized delay second. So I'm giving it a two hour window. Run it every day within a two hour window that's randomized. So they're not all hitting the registry at the same time, particularly if I have thousands of these things deployed. But what I'm doing instead is instead of using timers like that, just for general purposes, I'm going to have this look every minute to see if there's an update and then pull, pull the updated container image and relaunch the container. So now we need a way to launch our container service itself. So if you scroll down here, this is the, the one of the last pieces to the puzzle where we create a container HDB service file. Now, I did not write this file. I actually used Podman to generate this for me. So if you have a container image in a registry somewhere, you can type the command podman generate system D, send it a couple of uh, arguments, and it generates this service file for you. And the nice thing about this is it does a lot of sensible things. One, it saves the PID and the container ID for you in, in the appropriate location. So percent %t will translate to like bear or something so it goes in the right location. You can run the command, the podman command, to launch your container. It generates this for you based on the definition of the container. And it um, looks for the prod tag, so it's only going to run container images that are tagged prod. And then it also runs conmon, so it, it launches some other um, uh, processes inside your container to monitor your containers correctly running and do restarts if it's not. And then when it, it also cleanly shut down things. So all of this was auto-generated for me. I didn't have to do this. I just used the podman generate system D command to, to create this. And then the last thing or the last piece in the kickstart file is enable the podman auto update timer. So check to see if there's a newer version of my containerized app and update if appropriate and then launch my container service or enable it at boot time to start. So I have an atomically o, uh, updating OS that's looking for new versions of my operating system and pulling them down as appropriate. And then my workloads are container workloads that are being atom or, um, automatically updated and, and restarted as necessary. So ostensibly, this gives you a touch-free way of maintaining systems that are fielded. So you don't actually have to, like I said, you don't have to copy files. You don't have to worry about stuff like that. It's, it's going to do all that for you. So how do we actually go about deploying something like this? So like I said, we're going to create a, a very simple web server. So I'm going to actually do two things here. Let me uh, just put this vertically. Let's do SSH here. Let's go to 005. So I'm going to say pkill. Okay, let's do a one quick switch over here. And I'll spend around 40,000, whatever this, what's it, whatever's in this directory. And then here I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to start with version 4 of the application. So um, I now have a web server running on my host where I built these images that's providing this content and the kickstart file to somebody that needs to start. So if I go into VMware, or I'm sorry, VirtualBox, make sure I'm in the pre-install config state, I'm going to go ahead and start this guy. So one thing to note here, if I hit settings, under storage, I'm already mounting a boot ISO image. So I'm not doing a pixie boot. It already has an ISO that it can draw from. So we'll go ahead and we'll start this target device that we need to provision. And you'll see it pull content from the left-hand side. So Go ahead and start this. Clear some of this stuff out. I'm going to hit tab, and now I'm going to tell it who your kickstart from. I won't need your iPad. You want to say you're going to create a big file? Okay. Anyway, Annie. Okay. 
Yes. So it's going to do a fully automated install using the Kickstart file. So you'll see the activity on the web server on the left hand side as it pulls all that content once it once it does the uh, startup. The first thing you'll see it pulls the uh, Kickstart file itself. Give it a second here. So just grab the uh, the Kickstart file, and now it's going to pull all the content when it goes to the install. So. <coughs> Any questions while this is running? Like I said, it's a it's a 600 megabyte image, so you can see the percent thing climbing slowly on the screen there, it's the 15%, 16%, it's fully on top of it. Any questions from anyone? Or? All right, so once this gets provisioned, I'll talk about Green Boot next and how it does a health check to make sure that the system is properly up and running. So, like I said, that was a Google Summer of Code project. We're going to use the scripts. We'll use bash files to determine if we're in a good state or a bad state and force a rollback. So we can show you that how that works. Anybody uh, comments on this? Like, do you see that this is useful? Do you see this is Yeah, I find it uh, quite interesting, although I have to admit, uh, the most recent thing I learned, I didn't realize that Podman command existed to build your uh, system D files, which I find incredibly tedious, so thank you for that point. Yeah, that is that is actually an important thing, and not only does it create your, your system D files, but it, it gives you the correct options for them, like it sets up a lot of stuff automatically. All right, so one for unfortunate thing about VirtualBox, it kept that boot ISO uh, mounted, so I gotta power this off, go into settings, storage, and just unmount that. So we need, uh, we need to remove that from the drive. And now, if we fire this up, it'll be booted into that Atomic OS image. So let's start up here. Oops. So you'll see it says OS Tree Zero. Zero is the most current image that's available. So it's gonna go ahead and boot. And it waits for the uh, networking to come up. So core, edge, so this is running. So I'm in um, my Atomic OS. So the only writable portions of the operating system are var and Etsy. Everything else is kind of locked. But let's go ahead and take a look at Green Boot. So if we go to the Green Boot directory and also do a uh, control units. So let's do a, let's actually sort that out. So we so you'll see that there are some Green Boot services automatically running. So what they're going to look at, if I clear this, I know it's, the font's a little smaller, I can't really zoom in there. Um, I go to Etsy Green Boot. There's a couple of directories. So there's a check, a green dot D, and a red dot D. Under check, I go into there, there's two directories, required and wanted. So you put bash scripts inside these various directories. So if you do like a... a, a, a so, in the required directory, these are scripts that must be successful. They cannot return with any status other than zero. In wanted, I want them to succeed, but they're not necessary. So it's more of a desired capability than a, than a required. Green is any scripts you want to run after a successful boot, and red is any scripts you want to run before rollback. 
So if you want to like, tell somebody something, put something in their log that this all went sideways, or you know, give them information to maybe figure out why they, they didn't succeed, you can do stuff like that. So again, they're just shell scripts. You'll notice there's a naming convention here where this one starts with 00, so that's going to be the first one to run. Uh, you can then number these if you want to, uh, you know, just by naming convention to force them to go in a certain order. And it will run your scripts to determine if this is a good that's update. That's my file name order. So what we can do is we can force a update to fail. So the first thing I want to check, though, is how much time do I have on my automated check. So the RPM OS tree automatic, which is the last timer listed to the right, is going to execute in 57 minutes. So we have time to play here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a shell script to the required directory. So I'll go to check fired. And we'll call this, we're just going to kick for that. Pseudo VI, and we'll saw 01 fail. Alright, let's do a little shell script here. It's going to say false. But I want to be careful here. So I don't just want to do that. If I do that, the thing is going to loop. It's going to constantly fail every time it tries to roll back because it's always going to get a failure. So the other thing we're going to do here, we're going to say remove, let's see, green boot. Fired dot B, what do we call it, zero one fail. So I'll remove the shell script and return false. There's a good uh, Linux question. Why does that work? How can I remove the file I'm running and it would still work? Does anyone know the answer to that? This is just a Linux quiz. Because it's already run in memory, so it doesn't need file on your disk. It's running in memory, but is the file still on the disk? So my understanding, and I, I could be wrong here, so I'm, I'm hoping to learn as well. Linux has inodes that refer to files. So names are mapped to inodes, inodes are mapped to actual content. So when I do a remove of a file, I'm actually subtracting the inode count on that file or the number of references to that inode. So when the number of references go to zero, it's removed from the disk, or it's, it's no longer accessible. So what's happening is by typing that rm command where it is, while this is still running, the file is actually still taking space on the storage, but there's no longer a file name referring to it. So the, the inode or, or the reference count for the inode is now zero. So when this exits, that file is essentially gone. Like it's, it's no longer accessible. But it's there while the, while the application's running. So you don't actually lose access to the information because the application itself is holding a reference until it, is, it exits. That's my understanding. If anybody has some uh, correction to that or knows a little bit more what's going on, I'd be interested to learn. But. That's why that works. You can't actually remove question. an executable while you're doing it, and it won't actually cause any problem to cause your execute. So if you had a hard link, I guess the file would still remain just at the other length. Of right, because a hard link is pointing, that's just two references to the same location on the disk, right? So they're both, and if you check that, there's an LS uh, option where you can say how many links are there to this file, and it'll tell you if it's one, zero, or you know, how many four. Actually, it shows up in an ls-l. That's the second number that nobody knows what it's for. Is that what that is? Yep. Because right. technically, technically, your first file, there's always one hard link, your first file. Yep. Right? And then you, know, you can add more. But yeah, if you look at a, if you know an ls-l, you'll see more, you know, that, that number increment as the number of hard links you get to it. All right. So we are set up. So green boot is going to say this sucks, and it's not going to allow the, the, the update to occur. So let's go ahead and go back and we'll check uh, what we have here. So we have 53 minutes. So I'm going to actually run that command directly. I'm not going to wait that long or keep you on the line that long. So let's go ahead and switch to version 5. Or we'll switch our app server or our web server over to version 5. So this one are execute or exited and now we're running this guy. So let's exit out of here. Shut that off. Okay, so we'll see content pool. Now the pool here will be a lot smaller because I already have 
uh, most of this stuff running. So let me go to my virtual machine here. here. And what we're going to do is instead of waiting for that timer to go off to activate that service, I'm just going to run that service directly. So I can say sudo system control start <coughs> rpm os tree automatic. So a couple of things are going to happen. Here. One, it's going to pull the content and stage it. And then that other timer that's running on a one minute cadence is going to notice that there's staged content and it's going to force this to reboot. So it's a little hinky how all this is going to go. We might have to wait up to a full minute to see this happen, but it is now running that service to pull the, uh, the updated content. So there it goes. You'll notice that it pulled it fairly quickly. There wasn't a whole lot of content there to pull. And if we can check the timers and see there's about 45 seconds here before it does the apply update. So, so we're just uh, just under a minute, and we'll see it grab the new content. Now that it's grabbed the new content, it'll actually do an automatic reboot, which will fail because the green boot's going to tell it to uh, it's no good. So we set false within the green boot. So you can see what our time is looking at now. We're 20 seconds to go time, and then the uh, it will try to apply these updates atomically. So. Again, it pulled relatively small amount of information from the web server, um, which is just the deltas between the new image and the prior image. So it, it was very small, the amount of data that passed. And there it goes, it's doing its reboot and applying the new updates. Um, it's actually shutting down. Then you'll see at the boot window, it'll, tell, it'll show you that there's two versions now, a zero and a one, where zero is the current, one's the older. And it's going to automatically boot. It failed, so now it's rolling back. And there's no more green boot there. So it's going to boot me back to where I was before because it wasn't able to do the update. And hopefully this does not loop. <laughs> I believe this is going to work and be successful. Yay! So we can log in as Core Edge. And, and we're on the prior version of the OS, so we're not on the updated version. And I know that because in this version, interesting. I added it. I mean, I'm going to have to talk to you about this because in the original version, S-Trace was included, and in the new version, S-Trace was removed. It looks like it applied the update even though the um, Ooh, that's even though it failed, or maybe it tried to apply it twice. So it, it, that's I'm not quite sure when the green boot reported a false, if it rolled back to the prior one, or it just tried to do the update again. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure uh, in full transparency. I've been multitasking, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if that actually did what I thought it would do, but it looks like it did update the image, so it looks like it, it updated it anyway. So I need to drill into Greenwood a little bit more and understand the semantics. I thought by putting a false there that it would cause a failure, but it looks like it might have tried to apply it again. They do an SC Greenwood, our, our script should not be there. It isn't, so it did delete it. So I'm not sure exactly what what happened there. The other thing that I'm trying to have, but but would putting a false there actually return false, or you have to do an exit one? No, if you do false, well, I know. Yeah, I get. I get if you run if you run it like that, but technically you're inside of a shell. So I, I there might be semantics, but I just was. I just was curious. I've always, you know, if I wanted to force a failure, I've always done an exit one. You probably always done a false, and we probably always ended up the same spot. But I'm just yeah. saying, there, 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 there's some, there's some idiocy, idiosyncrasies that can happen in there. You're right. It might have swallowed that. Let me see. Let's, let's try. Let's, let's try that. Okay. Wrap, wrap, wrap it in. A, you know, create a, create a really small shell, and run it, and check the exit statement of the shell. Because when you're running from the command line, you're in the same shell. So. I get burned by that all the time, but I'm, maybe I'm just overcomplicated. No, oh, that's right. It no. might, the shell might have swallowed that, that, and it never reported the one. So it just it just said successful and it rebooted. 
So I think that might have been what happened. So like if we do this, if we do this, I think you're right. I think that's what happened. Yeah, if you put that false in there, and then you run the shell with it and check dollar dollar question mark, um, does it does it return zero or one? And I don't know the answer to that, by the way. <laughs> All right, I think you're right. Oh, return. No, return one. You're fine. Yeah, so that's. I, I have to admit, I've always done exit one at the bottom of things like that, or like inside of a for loop if I want to, if I want to stop in its tracks, but apparently it doesn't matter, so good call. That was a good thing. Let's try true, then it should be, uh, should become zero. Yeah. So, I'm not really sure why that, that, that allowed the update to go forward. It shouldn't have, it should have rolled back to the prior version, but I'll have to drill into, you know, I might be missing something. Yeah, because because uh, yeah, because you you want it to because like you might have some other uh, other arbitrary tests like it might start, but because it's you know some some unit test that you want to make sure that you know come 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 heck or high water you want it to you want it to be okay and it and it doesn't meet your criteria you just want to continue running the same version as opposed to deploying a a a broken version so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So put out what's going on there but um, so that's basically the demo that I have for today. Now we can go ahead and um, look at some of the stuff we did before. So go ahead and just power this off. <coughs> so if we control C here, the other thing we can do is we did download or create another image. So I can say compose your CLI, um, compose status. It'll show that they all finished. So this is the FOSS RFE image, and that's its ID. So we can do a composer CLI compose image and uh, select which one was it, 3A. And that will pull the tar file. So I have the tar file for the image that I built. So I can create a directory, move that image down there, go up here. Do a uh, extraction on that, and I can check the compose file to see, you know, some metadata about this image that I created. Um, specifically, the commit. This is key if I want to create like a, something that inherits from this. Um, and then you, know, you can look at the package. I don't remember the, the specific syntax for the RPM OS tree the DB list command, but you can look at the packages that are included within the image. The, the other thing that wasn't working was the, I don't think Podman was correctly starting the, um, the container images in the example, so I wasn't able to show you the container getting updated. There is on this system a registry that's running, just a simple Docker registry. So like I said, I have a version one, a version two, production's linked to version one. I can move production to version two pretty easily, but the, the um, target system isn't, isn't running that correctly and I need to figure out why. Um, so that's what I wanted to show you guys is, you know, the goal here is to create the ability to easily update OS, um, the underlying OS itself. So you define a base level OS that's hosting your apps. And if your apps are containers, you can easily update them also. However, within that um, OS, you could run a VM, you could run just a native application. You could, you could do a lot of different things. You don't necessarily have to uh, use containers to run things. And then uh, John said he was interested in the Podman generate stuff. So the way that works, um, if I want to create a uh, system D file for Podman, it's just Podman generate system D. Um, let's see what the, I think of the, the commands here. I've done this before. Let me look at my uh, build image script. I actually have it in there. Cool. So there's a couple of things you need to do. So if I scroll down here, right here. So I actually run the container image 
with the specific options I want to send it. So mount, volume mount this directory, fix the Linux labels, or the SE Linux labels, tell it to restart always, give it the port mapping, things like that. I want this to run privileged. So I do that, and then once that container ID, that returns me a container ID, once that's running, I then send it the podman generate system D command. So what this does new says set this up like it was never running before. So make sure that you can properly pull an image from a registry, launch the container application correctly, you know, run conmon inside your environment to make sure that it's up and running. Files will generate the files for you and dump them into the file system. And then name is simply the name of the, uh, the you know, give it the name of whatever the, the the container was, and then you pass it the container ID. So in this case, <laughs> it's going to create something called um, container underscore registry dot service. So, so that's where that comes from. And then I stop any running containers, I remove the containers, and I remove the images from my local cache. So basically, I'll just have a clean system here. So I just stand this up long enough to generate the system you found and wipe everything out. So that's, that's essentially what's going on there. And it, and it puts the system D file in, you know, SC system D somewhere, right? Um, it doesn't. So it's just local. So basically, I take my container registry service, I copy it to etsy system D system, um, set the SC Linux context, context, then I can enable it and start it and then do it either way. Do it. So that's really where it start. drops it in, this, in the local directory, or is there some path I missed in that? Okay. Yeah, it drops it in your local directory. Wherever you run this command, it's going to drop off in that directory. Thank you. So then you move it to, you don't put it in user log. That's where the main system is stuff is, the official stuff. But you can put it into Etsy, and then this will link it to, you know, socket once or whatever that is the, um, the target that, that's responsible. This creates a soft link so that it starts. So that's the that's the mechanics of doing that. So you just generate the file, and then you move it to the appropriate location and, and enable it. And then every time this boots, I now have a running registry listening on port 5000, so I can just use a simple non-authenticated registry to push it forward. Get it then you'll see, you know, it's the version one that says, welcome to Frederick Open Source. Version two says, you know, add something about Podman update because it updated. And you just move the production tag between the two to get that to trigger. Unfortunately, I'm not able to show that to you because it's, it wasn't working last night. Well, Messing with this, and I know it's <laughs> troubleshoot. Any questions on this? Um, I'm going to go through the one of the other things too, which is cool. So, the Tomo files have more options, like I mentioned, than are supported in the UI. So we can actually cover some of those. One of those that's not implemented yet is repos.git, and I think this is a great idea. So. When you're creating your image, you can specify your packages, your modules, your groups. What this allows you to do is point it at a GitHub repository that contains a set of files, package that as an RPM with a target location to go into, this, into the system that's being provisioned. So the thought I had is I could create a GitHub project for all of my green boot scripts that I want to verify that the image is good. And then I can have this deployed to Etsy Greenboot when it installs the system. So I can create the list of checks for this version of the operating system that I want to have run and update those. So, you know, if you still have to be a little careful here that you're not adding to files. You know, you don't want to have old checks and new checks. You want to use a naming convention where they're being overwritten. But this will package this as an RPM for me and add it to the atomic image. So I don't have to, in my kickstart, you know, do, do other things to create the, the check scripts. I can actually just have it packaged as part of the image, the, the help checks that need to be ex executed. So if I take a look at this, all I did was just create a simple Git repository where I can put, you know, dummy scripts that are always true, like they always return good and then go in and, and change these. So if you go through these directories, that's just all that's there. Uh, if it succeeds, it's just the dummy. If it fails, it's just the dummy. So I can, with that repos.git capability, when that's implemented, I'm able to do stuff like this, where I can just basically use git to track what these health checks are and then package them as an RPM and put them into the image file itself. 
like I said, there's a long list of stuff you can do here. It's quite capable what you can add to the blueprint for your image beyond what's available through the UI. If I want to start a composed build, um, you can say uh, composer, compose, start. And then put the, uh, the name of the blueprint from the different tab and I start building boss again if I wanted to. And it would launch a job to do that. And then I can ask to see where that is. Right now everything's finished, it's already, it's already run. Any questions? Comments? No question, but uh, thanks for the deep dive. Um, really cool. Yeah. Yeah, very, very, very uh, we definitely see some possibilities with it. So that's, that's, and also, uh, um, nice job uh, framing the, the use case, which I thought was quite interesting. 